All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, episode 48, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. We've got, well, some stuff today. I am not sure whether that was my trip that basically ruined the number of news that I found or whether that was a just, you know, slow going week this time around. We don't really have that many things to talk about today. Um, so yeah, um, I also want to try a slightly different approach to what I've been doing. And instead of, you know, talking in depth about each article, I want to focus on more specific ones. So I want to have a look more deeply at the articles that I basically have something to say about. And if I'm not, I'm just gonna briefly tell you what the article is about and then move on, right? So let me know in the comments if you like this approach. Uh, or if you don't like it, if you have any other ideas, because I feel like, you know, just going through every article all the time can be a bit tiresome and is not really worth it, right? So let us start with the news. The first article we got here today is called Future JavaScript, What is Missing by Dr. Axel Rauschmeier, who is um, really great. I mean, if you never heard of him, do check out his stuff and especially his books. He's very good at what he does. And this article outlines the missing features from JavaScript in comparison to uh, specifically other languages, as well as the upcoming features uh, with the links to TC39 proposals and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, there are some very interesting things. So I uh, like the object comparison, which is for example, um, turns out it's, it's like there is a proposal for that, for the decorator, reserved decorator like syntax, which is kind of neat and would allow you to do that. Um, yeah, that's this like, yeah, a bunch of things. I don't want to go through all of them. A majority of them were already covered in this podcast multiple times, including pipeline operator, concurrency and standard lib and all that kind of stuff. But if you are not tracking all of this, but if you are curious about as to what are coming to JavaScript, what can be coming to JavaScript, do check it out. It is a pretty good summary. Next article we got here is from the overreacted blog, blog of uh, Dan Abramov, uh, one of the, um, uh, from the React team, right? And the uh, title of the blog is Why Isn't X a Hook? And it talks about uh, the decisions that uh, went into the React hooks, the default ones, and how did they decide on whether something should be a hook or something should be a function like react.memo in this example or context.provider uh, tag, right? Uh, so if you are curious about the React hooks, if you are curious about the design decisions and reasoning behind making something into a hook or making something into a component, for example, do check it out. There is some very interesting thoughts in here, um, some more sort of in-depth look into how hook works and why you should prefer hooks over components or functions, right? It's a very interesting article, so quite highly recommended. Next article we got here is what the flow team has been up to. This is uh, right up from the flow team uh, on the progress that has been done in 2018 and essentially the future of the flow and what are they uh, sort of going to be focusing on, what kind of features are they going to add, what kind of changes are they going to make and so on and so forth. We didn't really have, uh, we didn't really see uh, that many updates to flow in 2018, I think. Maybe there's like one or two, uh, if I remember correctly, or maybe I just haven't seen them in my Twitter at all. But yeah, uh, it's, it's still curious to see that the flow is, seems to be alive and kicking, uh, even though majority of, uh, you know, Facebook te uh, teams and Facebook tools, for example, adopting JavaScript now, like Jest is now, um, oh, sorry, not JavaScript, TypeScript. Jest is now using TypeScript and there's like uh, React is now using TypeScript. A lot of those are migrating to TypeScript, which is curious because, you know, Flow is coming from Facebook and it's supposed to be internal tool, but it doesn't seem like it's that widely used even in Facebook anymore, which is interesting. So I'm going to be curious to see how all of that stuff develops. All right. Next uh, thing we got here is actually not an article, but a scientific paper for those of you who, um, you know, dabble in science from time to time. It's called Mind the Gap, Analyzing the Performance of WebAssembly versus Native Code. And it's uh, essentially quantitative analysis of performance of WebAssembly versus Native Code on a bunch of benchmarks like PolyBench C and Spec CPU benchmarks. 
in both Firefox and Chrome and then you know the native performance to see how WebAssembly actually fares um, with regards to all of those typical benchmarks you run in C. I believe they use C uh, for comparison. So if you are curious and if you don't mind scientific language because this is like a proper scientific paper with all the things included, it might be a bit hard to read from time to time and it takes some time to get through it. There is some quite curious data. You can also just look at the charts and majority of time I think you would get, you know, most of the info you kind of want from a paper like this just by looking at the chart, but yeah, it's 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 curious and WebAssembly is definitely slower as you expect uh, from the native performance, but it's getting there. Like the, the relative performance is actually very impressive already now, especially in Firefox, if you look at the uh, results and tables and stuff like this. So if you're curious, if you're looking into WebAssembly and you wanted a more scientific approach to measure the performance, then there you go. This is the one that you should look at. Okay. Next thing we got here is object assign versus object spread in Node.js. A comparative look at the object rest spread and object assign, which is the old API that existed for quite some time. I think it was ES6, right? And it's been implemented for ages and it's been in Node and browsers. And it's also quite nice, but maybe not as convenient as rest spreads, but it has its own use cases, right? So there's some differences. And this article exactly talks about when you would use object assign and when you would use rest spread, which would help you in some cases and uh, hinder you in other cases, right? So there is some caveats applied and this article does a pretty good job of describing those. Next article we got here is building progressive web apps with React part one. Um, essentially what the title says, it's a tutorial on how to build PVAs with the React I'm not sure if you say PVA or PWA, but um, there you go. So this, I won't really go much in depth. It's a tutorial that guides you through the whole process. And if you already know how to do that, if you know how to use service workers, manifest and all that stuff, you won't find anything new here. If not, if you wanted to get into PVAs, do check it out, it's quite good. Next thing we got here is understanding callbacks and promises. Another tutorial that talks about, well, callbacks and promises. If you already understand callbacks and promises, won't find anything new. If you are still struggling with either of those concepts, do check it out. It does a pretty good job of explaining them. Next article we got here is overview of React Hooks. React Hooks release is imminent. In fact, we're gonna be talking about that in the next section of this podcast. And well, this article does a very good job of guiding you through the whole React Hooks Thing, starting from, you know, what is React Hook? How do you use them in projects? How do you use hooks for state? Um, how do you use multiple state hooks? How do you use effect hooks and all that kind of stuff? Essentially, it is a bit more in depth than the official React documentation uh, and does a bit more explaining as to, you know, how exactly some parts work. But yeah, if you already know uh, about the hooks, if you already tried them out, you won't really find anything new here. Otherwise, do check it out. It's a very good introduction. Next thing we got here is ES6 proxies. Essentially a tutorial into ES6 proxies, a very basic one. There is nothing very in depth about it. It just shows you how you can use proxies to override uh, methods on an object, uh, in this case, array specifically, um, which you know is the essentially the primary use case for the proxies, right? Um, proxies are very complex, like, okay, the idea of proxies is not complex, it's actually very straightforward, but what you can do with them is sometimes mind breaking. There are like some use cases where it takes me a couple of hours to literally just understand what the hell is going on because of all the reflections and, you know, overrides and stuff like this. It can be very powerful or it can be very hard to understand basically. <laughs> But I think it's a good idea to learn the concept of proxies and how to use them anyway. So if you are curious, do check this article out. It will get you started in about five minutes, basically. Right, next thing we got here is React introduction for people who know just enough jQuery to get by 2019 version. Just as the title says, this is a React tutorial that um, essentially starts the app or the tutorial bits as a jQuery I guess, application, right? And then rewrites the whole thing into React to show you how you can use React instead of jQuery to make it a bit nicer, in, at least in my opinion, right? I'm, I'm, I don't think I would go back to jQuery this time around at all, but you know, if you're still using it, it's absolutely fine. 
But if you wanted to learn React and were still confused as to how you translate stuff from jQuery to React, then this pretty lengthy tutorial explains just about everything you need to know about React and how does it maps to the jQuery methods, you know? So do check it out. It is pretty, pretty detailed. All right, next thing we got here is start contributing to Node.js in the new year. This is a tutorial that explains how you can start contributing to Node.js GitHub um, organization, actually, not just the repo itself, not just the code, because Node.js is not just one thing, right? It is far more than just a node repo. There is libuv, there is 2 billion of different uh, steering committees and working groups and other things that happen behind the scenes. So if you were curious how you can start contributing to any of this, because you know, it's, it's, it, it's not just code, right? So node is way more than that, including documentation, uh, including, I don't know, releases, community, uh, docs and all that kind of stuff. And there is 200 different ways of contributing to it. So if you ever wanted to do that, this article will get you started and will guide you through the whole process and will tell you what exactly you need to do to basically get uh, your name as a contributor to Node.js and help Node.js be a tiny bit better with your push, uh, sorry, pull request, right? So do check it out. Okay. Next thing we got here is how to create a REST API with Express in Node.js. Again, basic tutorial on how to build a REST API with Express. It also walks you through the basic concepts of what a REST is. Uh, nothing super complicated here. If you already built REST API or you know how to do that, you won't really find anything new. If you are still struggling with some concepts or maybe you wanted a good tutorial for Express, do check it out. It basically got everything you need to know. It also has the other parts of the tutorial that introduce you to databases, GraphQL, routing, and middlewares, and basically everything you can imagine. There is a lot of pretty good information here. The article is well written, so quite recommended if you are trying to get into that area. Next thing we got here is understanding promises in JavaScript. Uh, literally a tutorial on promises. Again, if you know promises already, you won't find anything new here. If you are still struggling with promises, do check it out. It is a pretty detailed, let me try that again. A pretty detailed explanation of what is going on uh, with promises, how do they work and how do you use them in real life. Very nice. Uh, I think it also includes the uh, async of eight at the very end. No, it actually doesn't. Uh, that I think was a different article, but there you go. So if you are curious about promises, if you are still trying to understand them, this article will do a pretty good job at explaining uh, basically all the concepts behind promises and showing you some code and how to use them. There we go. Next article we got here is enforcing code quality for Node.js. Uh, this is essentially a tutorial on how to set up linter and formatter like pretty, I think in, in this specific case, they use uh, prettier in ESLint with standard, which is sort of bundled in tool um, to set up code linting and formatting and then set up the CI to basically ensure that everything works uh, nicely and you don't have any problems with it. Um, so yeah, it's it's quite straightforward, but if you didn't know how to do that, do check it out. Uh, hey, Bakao, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got the NPM blog article called Continuous Security that talks about how does NPM addresses uh, security risks, uh, mitigates them, and how does they continuously improve it. So if you're ever curious about the NPM process on the security and how do they actually combat all those terrible uh, problems that we get from time to time with NPM, well, check it out. There's some interesting insights and some curious things that like they do a good job at you know, doing all of that. So it's, it's quite interesting to read about this. All right. Uh, next thing we got here is uh, the, we're switching from the articles to uh, tiny uh, awesome bits and tips. And the first awesome tiny thing happening, well, I, I wouldn't call it tiny thing actually, but it's just the, you know, the announcement is tiny. We got uh, React hooks with React version 16.8.0 releasing on the well, 4th of February. So that is gonna be Monday. So on Monday, we should see a React release with hooks happening and you can just use it in your production projects. Is there a list of links to the article? Yes, there is a list of links to the article. It is in GitHub. The link is in the description to the channel. You can, as usual, find it there and just uh, look through the list of the articles yourself. 
uh, React hooks in the community. Yes, React hooks has been in documentation for ages now. They are even on official website since first alpha they released. Basically, the docs are really good as usual. So you already have everything you need to get started right now. And in two days, you will be able to do that in production, which is freaking amazing because I absolutely love hooks and never want to go back to classes. So there you go. Okay, the next um, tiny thing we got here is the article called Reusable Time Travel with React Hooks and Immer. A really neat, um, essentially used time travel hook that allows you to uh, build up um, time travel, right? So you get the old states and then you get undo and redo buttons essentially for free, which is absolutely awesome. And this article explains how it is done and how you can do it yourself or you know, you can just reuse the existing hook. It is quite great. So if you are curious as how do you can use hooks and immer in this case for state management and do the time travel stuff with undo redo, I mean, it doesn't have to be the dot moving, it can be anything literally, right? As long as you persist the state. This is really cool. And yeah, it's it's amazing how easy it is to use it. You literally just have the time travel hook and, and it works. And then you can pass the same reducer and initial state you would to the use reducer hook. So it's, it's awesome. I cannot wait to see more hook related um, releases and articles because it is gonna be very fun. Okay. Next thing we got here is the uh, Chrome Canary version 73 uh, now finally supports dark mode, at least on Mac OS. I hope they will also do that on uh, Windows because I do like my dark mode stuff and that looks really slick. So uh, there you go. I'm hoping this is gonna make it release in a, what they usually release it to production in like eight weeks, I think after the previous version, right? So we just got Chrome 72 recently. So it's gonna be somewhere in uh, February or March, I guess. So yeah, looking forward to that. Um, next thing we got here is the Blink development team um, published intent to ship WebAssembly threads. We're finally getting WebAssembly threads, one of the most requested features from a majority of people who compile to WebAssembly. Uh, shipped quite soon, I guess. I don't know how much time, uh, how long does it usually take from the intent to ship to actually ship it, but um, I'm guessing a couple of versions of V8 and, or sorry, uh, Chrome actually in this case, because it's in the blink and we are gonna see it there. It is gonna be very cool. Just don't break temper monkey, please. Yes, yes, we are gonna talk about that in a few minutes, but uh, there you go. So Twitter uh, banning me. So apparently this is a thing that I didn't know, but uh, Node now has minus minus experimental minus REPL minus await flag that you can use to get top level await in Node REPL, which could be very handy. Works in Node version 10 and above. And uh, I think this is my new favorite thing because I can now experiment with the sync await without creating needless functions inside of a REPL, which is kind of really cool. So if you are also using it heavily, do check it out. This might be a tip for you. Next thing we got here is Apple Safari finally ships service worker and a bunch of progressive web app features on iOS 11.3. So Apple finally decided that it's time to, you know, uh, do this whole HTML5 thing, we love it and kill flash and everything when, you know, Steve Jobs was still alive and pushing. And uh, yes, you can now get proper progressive web apps on um, iOS, which is kind of great. But on the other hand, it's kind of amusing. So if you're interested in all the features that they shipped uh, in Safari 13 for iOS, there's the article, you can just check it out. The interesting thing is that at the same time, Google has announced that you can now publish progressive web apps directly on Play Store, which is freaking amazing. So if you have, <clears throat> apologies, if you have a progressive web app and the user have a Chrome 60, uh, 72 installed on Android, uh, you have a support for trusted web activity, which is essentially a progressive web app with a special manifest, which can be distributed directly through Play Store. So whenever a user goes into Play Store and searches for app, you will actually find your progressive web app that will be installed as a native app, but in reality will be just a link on a desktop to your PDA with some special per permissions, right? It is really, really cool. And there's already some examples like uh, Instagram, uh, Google Maps Go or Twitter uh, mobile, which actually works really great. There is also, uh, what was it? Where was the link? There is also an open source example. So you can just uh, fork it and try it out yourself. It is awesome. So um, 
if you're working, I don't know, like if you're working for mobiles, I probably don't need to explain to you how that works. But if you never did any mobile apps, I can tell you that these trusted web applications and progressive web apps can replace about half of what we have in a app store right now, because none of those apps really need access to any native features that are not available through progressive web apps. And it's very exciting times. I'm honestly stoked for this. And I, I don't know, I personally would love to see an operating system where I can use the web app that has access to everything, right? Like right now it's not the case and we already have access to majority of sensors and everything, but sometimes you still need a full blown Android project where you can actually access something like Google Health SDK or Apple Health Kit, right? And I will be curious to see how that will progress and where we will get with the whole thing. But man, web platform is becoming amazingly powerful and I am absolutely loving this. So yeah, there you go. Uh, just go ahead and publish your progressive web apps on Play Store right now for the users to find them there, basically. It's, it's awesome. All right. Next thing we got here is the new proposal for ECMAScript. Uh, it is a proposal for ECMAScript enums and it looks absolutely awesome. We can finally stop declaring constants with the same name and same string uh, and just use enums that could be either number, string, symbol, or whatever the hell you imagine, basically. Looks really great. Uh, it is stage zero for now, so it was basically just proposed and it already has a champion, which is a great thing. So we're going to see how fast it develops, but having enums in JavaScript is an awesome step uh, towards, you know, sort of more full featured language, I guess, because even though people say we don't need more features, I honestly seen so many examples of the code where people invent their own enums essentially that it's, it's just painful. It has to be in a language. There you go, quite exciting. Let's see how that develops. Uh, next thing we got here is yes, the whole manifest version three with Chrome extensions situation turns out it's not just gonna disable my favorite extensions like UMatrix and uBlock origin. But it's also going to affect extensions like Temper Monkey, for example, because apparently it just restricts executing remotely hosted code, right? And if you if you didn't know, Temper Monkey is uh, essentially what was the uh, user scripts um, thing for Chrome, right? So you can like install and run user scripts that do something to the websites, and you don't have to install separate extensions for that. And um, yeah, apparently manifest version three kills that because they, they consider remotely hosted code to be attack factor, which makes sense, but this thing has explicit permissions and it's kind of, I mean, I've been using it for ages and it's been okay, unless you install something, you, you know, you don't look at the code before. Sure, it, but all of the extensions are attack factor and this is kind of, this is weird. If if this manifest version three gets shipped, uh, half of the Chrome extensions I use just gonna get destroyed essentially, and this is gonna be very sad. So I'm I'm really looking. There's a lot of people unhappy about that, obviously, and and um, yeah, I'm hoping the Chrome team would rethink the whole thing and revert at least half of those changes to make it more extension friendly. Let's just put it this way. It's like I <laughs> I. At this point, you know, if they ship it, I will basically switch to some other browser that allows that because this is just ridiculous. Okay, next thing we got here is um, SpaceX just launched a GraphQL API. So you can now literally query all the SpaceX data using GraphQL. And there's even a Graph IQL console where you can, um, yeah, do, uh, different things, which looks insane. You can query rocket names with stages data and everything, which is kind of insane. So if you ever was curious about SpaceX data, you can now query it using uh, GraphQL. There you go. I wouldn't mind switching to Firefox. It got recently, uh, it got better recently. Yeah, it, I mean, Firefox is pretty good right now. Uh, there are still some features that are missing for me personally, and it's still lagging behind in terms of uh, ECMAScript support compared to Fire uh, to Chrome. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, if I pick between the extensions and uh, having the latest features, cool latest features, I would just go for extensions because it's just convenient. Like I pff, wouldn't even think for a second while switching. So let's see. <laughs> it will be it will be very funny and sad on the other hand, if, if Chrome kills itself by just shipping broken extensions essentially, which is, it's a bit ridiculous, but okay, there we go. So we got the releases section right now. The first release of the week is node 11.9, which essentially just updates OpenSSL. 
nothing major there and there's a bunch of uh, bug fixes and docs and tests but yeah if you're living on the edge be sure to update the next release we got is Nuxt version 2.4.0. If you're not familiar, Nuxt is an all-in-one framework for Vue.js, sort of like Next.js for React. Uh, it's really cool. If you haven't tried it, do give it a shot. Uh, the uh, new version uh, essentially adds support for TypeScript and a bunch of other things like smart prefetching and HMR and best practices. Nuxt is great if you're writing Vue.js, uh, definitely check it out. Um, if you are using React, well, then you're, you're likely using Next.js. But there you go. Next release we got here is Relay version 2.0. Um, I honestly never used Relay, so cannot really comment on any of that, but I've heard a lot of good things uh, about it from uh, basically people using it. So if you are using it, do sh make sure to check out version 2.0 and breaking changes they have. Uh, essentially, it seems to upgrade to the latest versions of React, GraphQL, and uh, using the Context API. But uh, yeah, I can't really say much more about it. All right, next release we got here is RxJS version 6.4.0, which is a minor release uh, sporting a bunch of bug fixes, introducing some minor features to existing operators as well as improving performance. So if you're using RxJS, make sure to update. It's always a good idea. The releases for RxJS is typically really cool and uh, the performance improvements are usually very, very impressive. So there you go. Next release we got here is Firefox 65 coming with a WebP support, Flexbox Inspector that was teased a few weeks ago, a new tooling and some platform updates. So if you are using Firefox, even for development, be sure to update. There is a lot of things, including some new JavaScript APIs like readable streams, relative time formats, storage access API, and some other things. So yeah, Firefox looking great. Again, you know, if Chrome kills off extensions, I wouldn't mind switching uh, at all. As I said, there are some features that are missing for me, but I believe there is basically extensions that fix that, which is, you know, still a bit annoying. I think those features should be in Firefox itself, but whatever. If I can fix it with extensions, I don't care much. There you go. Next release we got is ESM Loader version 3.2.0 with the hot module replacement support, which is kind of awesome. If you never used it, ESM is essentially allows you to use uh, yes modules right now in node in literally one line of code works great uh, you just use it as a require uh, I think it was called require hooks or maybe require extensions I don't remember require plugins basically minus r flag and node and it works really great and now supports HMR which is even better uh, have to leave we'll watch yeah good luck man uh, see you around in the discords all right, uh, continuing, we got React Easy State version 6.1.0 with a hook support, improved batching and strict mode, essentially addressing majority of my uh, problems I had with this library last time I used it. The batching was like the biggest problem and it seems to be completely fixed now. It also now supports hooks, but in a sort of weird way. So uh, this is the example of the hook support but it still requires you to wrap your component in view, which I think is sort of defeats the point of having React hooks. Like it could have been just a store hook and this would be perfect, but it's for some reason they still need that. I'm not exactly sure uh, why, but yeah, you know, if you're using it, I guess that works for you because you're kind of used to the same uh, format anyway. All right, continuing, we got TypeScript 3.3 with uh, some improvements to union types and some additional things I have no idea about. So if you're using TypeScript, be sure to check it out. Uh, I am not using it right now, so you know, can't comment much more about that. And I think the last release of the week is Jest24 with a ton of improvements, a new website, TypeScript support out of the box and uh, upgrade to Babel 7, which basically allowed that. It is great, it is awesome. Jest is right now my favorite, uh, test runner, so do check it out if you haven't tried it. If you already tried it, make sure to update to Jest24 because I am sure it is gonna be way better than the previous version and now you can just use TypeScript out of the box without any changes essentially, which is just awesome. So there you go. All right, that is it for releases. Now we are at the libraries and demos section and the first library we have today is Overmind.js, frictionless state management. Uh, this is essentially another state management library for, uh, well, not just React, it actually supports Viewing Angular as well, as well as TypeScript, so it's kind of great. Uh, it's also really cool that they have 
essentially different documentation for uh, all of those different combinations. So you can actually say like, you know, I'm working in React and TypeScript and it will actually give you the React and TypeScript code snippets in a docs, which is just awesome. So if you were looking for, um, you know, state management solution that is supports complex use cases, then do check Overmind out. It seems to be really cool. I I don't think it actually supports React hooks yet uh, because I never I haven't seen any mentions for that. But I pers I don't know like you know after trying React with hooks I don't really want to go back like I just don't want to use other components. Hooks are just so much nicer. But there you go. If you were looking for a traditional state management solution, do check it out. It seems to be quite good. All right. Next thing we got here is blockade, a secure headers and cookies for Node.js web frameworks. Seems to be very similar to Helmet, uh, but I believe Helmet is just works for like stuff like Express and Festify, while Blockade seems to support a bunch of other frameworks, including including Adonis, Koa, Meteor, Polka, Restify, whatever you can imagine. Essentially, seems quite nice. Basically, adds all the uh, secure headers and stuff that you should have by default to your requests and responses. I guess responses in this case actually. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you are running the app, it's always a good idea to uh, follow the uh, all of us um, best practices and include stuff like this. So check it out. Next thing we got here is Flex Search, next generation full text search library for browser and Node.js. Another one, there's been quite a lot of them lately. I think in, in last four or five podcasts, we had like at least one of the full text search libraries written in JavaScript included. And yeah, this is just another one uh, that uh, actually is surprisingly tiny for a full text search, just five kilobytes gzip with a full feature set and everything. And if you just want some features, it goes down to 2.7 kilobyte gzip, which is damn impressive to be honest. And there's also the um, performance comparison with majority of actually existing libraries, including Elastic Lunar that we used in uh, one of the dev streams. Seems to be quite neat. So yeah, if you are looking for JavaScript uh, full text indexing, do check it out. This one seems to be pretty full featured and quite nice. All right, next thing we got is Ink, a React for interactive command line apps, or I would say React like, uh, but yeah, it essentially allows you to write command line apps uh, using React like syntax and React like components, which actually seems pretty neat. And it also has a set of developed components that you can just use um, by importing them, like password input, console spinners, checkboxes, whatever. The GIF looks very nice. Have you heard of Algolia search? I have heard of Algolia, but isn't Algolia just a software as a service as in you cannot use it just inside your project without actually giving the data to them? At least this, this was my understanding when I researched it, but I might be mistaken. Like if you have money to pay or if you have a small project that can rely on the free tier they give, it's it's really cool, but you know, that means you are not self-sufficient essentially. Sometimes you just cannot do that. Okay, continuing, we got Mintable, roll your own Mint clone for personal finance using Google Sheets and Plaid API. Uh, exactly as it says, it's sort of a Mint clone that allows you to do everything in, in Google Sheets, which I, I mean, you know, if you're doing everything in Google Sheets anyway, so. We, you can just use Google Sheets, but if you want a nicer interface, I guess you can use Mintable. So check it out if this is your thing. I personally find with my bank statistics for my finance management. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. All right, next thing we got here is React Resize Observer Hook. The uh, Resize Observer uh, use hook for React. You can just uh, use um, Resize Observer and then pass the parent reference and then just get a entry that has with and hate essentially that you then use to, for example, set state or whatever. Very straightforward, very simple, very nice hook. So if you are, um, yeah, if you're gonna start using React hooks on Monday, I know I do, then you might as well use that if you need Resize Observer because it looks quite nice. All right, next thing we got here is SVG Loaders React, React implementation of SVG Loaders library by Sam Herbert. Um, yeah, it's essentially, you know, there's the very nice SVG Loaders uh, library that includes a bunch of very nice loaders that are essentially very tiny because they are SVG. 
And this is exactly that, but in a React form so that you don't have to uh, copy paste it yourself and you can just use a component, right? And it seems to be also tree shakeable and everything. So if you needed loaders in your React app, do check it out. This seems to be quite cool. Next thing we got here is X spreadsheet, a JavaScript spreadsheet for web that actually looks uh, pretty damn impressive. Uh, worth noting that this thing is actually rendered using canvas, which is a bit mind blowing and uh, a bit strange choice, I would say, but it seems to be working quite well. So if you're looking for a spreadsheet library that I'm not sure actually that probably hinders accessibility, right? Because it renders the canvas. I'm not sure it's probably not accessible at all, but I haven't delved into that part. But if you just needed spreadsheet for your personal use and you don't care about accessibility much, do check it out. It seems to be pretty sleek and full featured. Uh, looks very close to the um, Google spreadsheets actually. So yeah. All right, next thing we got here is a new library from Mr. Luke Edwards uh, called HTTPy. A node HTTP client as easy as a Pi. It is an HTTP client that has a very, very nice API essentially. And since it is done by Mr. Luke Edwards, you know it is gonna be super tiny and super fast. It has no dependencies and is just 600, 300, uh, God damn it, 634 bytes. There you go. It is, looks great. So if I think if I would need a tiny client and I would be working in a resource constrained environment, I would definitely go for this one. I probably should also star it because I forgot to do that. There we go. All right, continuing, we got Animated, an always interruptible declarative animation library for React. Uh, this is a proof of concept for now as it relies on hooks that are still not released. I am guessing it's gonna make it to the production as well, but let me just demonstrate the library to you. So the code itself, where's the demo? Wait a second, there's the example. So the code itself is not extremely complex, it's just basically hooks, but the most impressive thing is the animation. So you can click a button, it will start the sequence, right? So the animation is relatively straightforward. The cool thing is that you can click a button anytime it's animating and it's gonna repeat the animation and then return to the original position. This is what it means by interruptible overlapping animation. This looks slick as hell. And this library allows you to do that. And it also supports like interpolation springs and all that kind of stuff that you would typically expect from a library like this. So if you are curious, do check it out. This is very awesome and very exciting to see that essentially released. Okay, continue, we got a RxJS Spy, a debugging library for RxJS. Essentially allows you to tap into any observable and uh, spy on it and log it later on to the console. Uh, by utilizing a bunch of methods it provides. So if you're working with RxJS, check it out. Maybe this will help you debug it. All right, next thing we got here is React Switch, a draggable toggle switch component for React uh, that is also accessible, customizable, and just two kilobytes gzipped. The demo is available over here. It is very slick and you can drag it and there's no bugs and yeah, it's, it just looks great. Like if you were looking for a switch component like this, do check it out. This seems to be working perfectly fine. And uh, yeah. Right, next thing we got here is GraphQL less, a REST and GraphQL that aren't that different. Um, this seems to be a sort of express middleware essentially that allows you to set up GraphQL in a simple way. And I, I, I don't know, I didn't have time to dwell into it, but it is a bit confusing because I tried to read the, you know, read me and figure out what is going on here, but I just couldn't from the examples, but maybe you will, so do check it out. Next thing we got here is Agenda, a lightweight job scheduling for Node.js. Um, in comparison to existing solutions like Bool, Q and B, uh, first of all, it's based on MongoDB, not Redis, which seems like a, Interesting choice, let's just put it this way. And second of all, the primary advantage over the existing tools that are more full featured actually, as you can see from this chart, is the REST API. So if you ever looked for, a, I guess, all in one solution for job scheduling that has REST API, then do check Agenda out. But again, make sure that you um, account for MongoDB running in the backend. All right, next thing we got here is Finance.js, a JavaScript library for financial calculations. It has API for basically all the things that you need to do in finance, like amortization, compound interest, future value, 
leverage ratio and a bunch of other terms I have no idea about. So if you are working with the finance and you needed to do that in JavaScript, um, check it out. This seems to have like formulas for just about everything. I wonder if that supports big, uh, big int actually, because you know, working with a financial data requires precision and JavaScript numbers can be a bit finicky with regards to that. So, but it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's cool anyway that you actually got a library for that in JavaScript. So check it out. Next thing we got here is the launch modern responsive cross-platform self-hosted web IRC clients. If you are still using IRC and if you don't really want to have a local client or you want to have an online client that is always configured for you and that you can use from anywhere, well, this um, lounge seems to be quite nice and you can self-host it and uh, seems to be pretty easily configurable. So do check it out. Seems to be quite nice. Next thing we got here is Learn React app. Application that will help you learn React fundamentals. Install this locally. There's a guided tutorial as well as guided exercises. So it's an app written in React that teaches you React. You install it locally and then run it and there's a React tutorial that essentially guides you through everything you have to know about React. I'm not sure if it includes hooks, which you know at this point it should, but it looks actually quite nice. So if you wanted to get into React and if you were still figuring out um, how do you do that and how do you start? This app got you covered, just install it and go through all the points. Seems to be pretty neat. All right, next thing we got here and the last library and demo we have is functional TypeScript, a TypeScript standard for rock solid serverless function. It seems to be a utility that essentially allows you to transform standard TypeScript function into a serverless function that you can call using HTTP requests. If you are working with serverless, uh, that seems to be very nice. Do check it out. It also seems to be pretty full featured and there is a lot of interesting thoughts in here. Uh, if you're not working with service functions, well, you are likely don't really care much about that, but uh, yeah, there you go. All right, that is actually it for the libraries and demos. Now I just got some uh, silly and interesting things left. And the first one is the update from HackerRank that says that the JavaScript overtakes Java as the most popular language, um, most popular programming language, right? So the JavaScript as of 2018 is now more popular than Java, which is, well, to be honest, not very surprising. Uh, but yeah, it is kind of awesome to see that. There is a lot more insights in the article and uh, on the hacker rank itself. So if you're curious, there's like the full skills reports. There is very, uh, like a ton of very interesting statistics with regards to frameworks, to used uh, technologies, what the developers want to learn, what is hiring managers want and so on and so forth. So do check it out. There is a trove of very curious data in here. Uh, also, yeah, like stuff like pet PVs at work, which is kind of amusing. Uh, yes, the links are, you should find the GitHub description, oh, God damn it! let me try that again. There is a link below in the channel description or video description if you're watching this later on YouTube that leads to the BXS Weekly GitHub and the BXS Weekly GitHub has the latest episode 48. There is no bot for that. I'm sorry for that. I am terrible at this Twitch streaming. So <laughs> you will have to scroll down to the channel and get it over there. <laughs> All right, so yeah, they would definitely recommend looking at this hacker rank report. It is really interesting. There's a ton of really cool data. So there you go. Next thing we got here is um, the article that kind of blew up the internet, I guess. The Facebook uh, had an app that paid teenagers and primarily targeted teenagers and kids to install VPN on a phone that spied on them and literally sent all the traffic to Facebook. And they paid something like 20 bucks per month to anyone who used that, which is absolutely ridiculous and violates Apple and Google terms of service. Uh, and yes, Rambling Geek, hello, hello, and welcome to the stream. I should have said that earlier, but there you go. So there is a very big article from um, the TechCrunch, a very detailed one and um, very interesting to read. It is already old one because, you know, I, I noticed it like, yeah, four days ago. There's already been a um, fallout of all of that. Uh, I basically Apple banned all the um, Facebook certificates and they can no longer publish any of that stuff and half of their apps no longer work as far as I understand. Google did the same. And yeah, it is, the privacy is a shit show in 2018 and 2019 essentially. 
So if you care about your privacy, do check this article out. Look at what all the like things described here and tell your kids, educate them about privacy and tell them, you know, they shouldn't install anything that gives them money for free because that is very fishy, to be honest. Facebook, like, you know, on, on one hand, we have those amazing teams at Facebook that have made React, that have made Jest, that have made... I don't know, there's like a ton of GraphQL. There is a ton of amazing technology teams that produce incredible tech that we use on a daily basis and that a lot of people benefit from. On the other hand, we have Facebook, the company that does shit like this. And I just kind of wish they would just shut down and stop doing that. But, oh man, it is a very, very sad state we're in with regards to privacy. But yeah, let's, let's see how the 2019 goes. All right. The last thing I got here for you today is a joke from I am developer Twitter account um, about Marie Kondo, who seems to be gaining popularity recently, at least across my people I follow at Twitch, Twitter. Um, the Jira joke about, you know, Marie Kondo asking, what is this? And me answering, it's called Jira. Marie Kondo says, does it spark joy? And me saying, absolutely not. And Mary says, thank it and then discard it, which is... Something I wish I could do at majority of companies I worked at with Jira, but um, yeah, it's usually not the developer's decision. So there you go. This is basically all I have for today. As usual, you can find all the links on GitHub. Uh, you can, uh, like if you have anything, throw it right now into chat. I will be more than happy to look at your project, look at the news that I might've missed during week. Again, this week I've been traveling, so I might've missed a lot of news. Uh, if you want to chat about JavaScript, join our Discord server. If you have any questions to me, just ask them here right now. Or again, join our Discord server. We'll be more than happy to talk to you. Um, that's basically it from my side. Unless you guys have any questions, we can wrap this up here and go and uh, do something else. Did you look at us? Uh, wait a second. Did you look at this uh, schedule? What? No, I have not looked at that, but I will check this out after a stream. Thank you for sharing. So I will put it on my off screen and we'll check it out. I mean, I have the Twitch schedule thingy uh, right now from the Streamlabs, I believe. Uh, okay, I will not open my channel because it's streaming. But um, yeah, my schedule is a bit of a mess, to be honest, but there you go. All right, guys, I give you a couple more seconds to uh, see if you have any other questions or suggestions. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for your continued support. I hope you enjoyed the stream and uh, yeah, have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching VOD of this. I see you on Wednesday for the development stream and on next Saturday for another BXGS Weekly. Seems like there's no questions, so... Thank you guys so much for watching and I see you next time. Bye.